rarely do I say you got to cut an expense. Almost never. Welcome to the Let's Talk Business podcast, a project of the Ptex Group. Gain valuable, actionable ideas from the world's top business leaders to help you take the next step in your business journey. And now, here is your host, Manny Hoffman. Coming to you from the P-Tech headquarters in Brooklyn, New York. This is the podcast for no-nonsense advice to help you learn, grow, and lead. Today, I'm so excited to welcome our guest, Chaim Tauber. Chaim shares invaluable insights on setting clear financial goals, long-term planning, and budgeting, especially in the face of today's high inflation and living costs. We explore the psychology of using credit cards and debit card spending, particularly within large families and among frequent travelers. Tune in to hear real-life success stories and rapid-fire advice on impactful books and personal aspiration. This episode promises to transform your financial life with practical wisdom and proven strategies for responsible spending and long-term savings. Get ready to be inspired and empowered to achieve financial freedom with expert advice. Without further ado, here is my interview with Chaim Tauber. Now, before we get to the full interview, I want to ask you for a favor. If you enjoy this episode, Please share with at least two friends. You'll help them get to financial freedom and learn so much from this episode. And maybe they'll get hooked on this podcast and learn from all the other guests on the show. Thank you. Chaim, thank you so much for joining me on the Let's Talk Business podcast. Hi, how are you? Good. So, so first of all, you know how, how long I've been after you um, to schedule this interview. Um, the reason for that is um, most people are used to the guest on the show speaks about business growth, uh, personal development. And we also sometimes bring on people speaking about finance, but usually it's related to business finance and understanding your numbers and so on and so forth. However, with the climate and the economy, what's out there and people are suffering in inflation and people's personal budgeting is becoming a bigger issue. And when I'm saying a bigger issue, it's not only because um, just they can't cover their own, their, their personal expenses, but once a person gets in the rabbit hole of, of running around all day, all week, all month, just to cover in the basics, it takes away their head from doing anything else. So it's a very important part of the growth of a person on the on the personal growth and ultimately on the uh, on the family growth and ultimately on the business as well. Whatever they do, should they be our employer, should they be employee, they can focus because they're running around covering their budget, so to speak. You are throughout the years I've seen people praise the work you do and the work you've done with them on the personal side and helping people. Um, create that financial freedom and ultimately understand what what that needs to look like on a, every person, depending on their budget. So I figured it's time to bring you on to discuss a couple of those, um, a couple of those fundamental topics that you're very passionate about. And our, I know that our listeners will will enjoy a lot and hopefully adapt a lot of what we're going to be discussing today in their everyday life. Okay, so let's start um, how you got into this space. Uh, it's not something that is a, you wake up as a kid and then you dream as, a, as somebody that's starting off something and saying, you know what, my profession will be helping people in their financials. Um, in their financials. So tell us a little bit the backstory for our listeners to get a better understanding of how you got into the space in the first place. So it happened by accident, I would say, or just I had a friend that complained that, hey, I can't cover my month. I earn more money than you in debt. I have credit card debt. At the time, I didn't even realize the dangers of credit card, credit cards, and he just couldn't cover his bill. He had told me that, remember a couple of months ago when you were by me for Shabbos and I hosted that Shabbos meal, I still didn't pay it off and I'm paying interest on that Shabbos meal. So I offered to help him. It took a couple of weeks until we decided, yes, I look into his finance. It's a taboo topic of one's finances, how much they earn, where they spend. But then he begged me and I helped him. We made a plan of him being able to become debt free within 12 months. Three months later, he was debt free. And then I just spoke to the next guy about finances and living responsibly, saving for the future, saving up to buy a house or an investment property. And then another friend and another friend. I started talking about and helping out just my friends until people I didn't know started reaching out. Hey, can you help me as well? And that's how it slowly but surely turned into a business. Got it. 
So when you sit with someone and discussing the finances, um, where's the first place you start? Um, and, and usually are those people that know they have an issue or they know they're just drowning and they're all over the place? We start first with our financial goals. What is it that you're looking to accomplish in our meeting? And one, what is it that you're looking to accomplish with your financial life? We create a long-term plan. Even if someone is currently in debt, I don't stop by, okay, let's help you become debt-free. It's about building a bright financial future, achieving financial stability first, financial freedom later, and being able to accomplish everything that you want to accomplish, even if you think that it isn't attainable. In most cases, it is, and we work towards getting that. So I want to start with uh, the question that's probably on everybody's mind. Um, Everybody listening to this um, would want to ask you is, if the numbers don't add up, which means is the cost of living is so high, inflation is so high, a, gr- a bag of grocery goods is mighty as expensive. This is the income I'm making for the last couple of years. Yes, I got a couple of a raise here and there. It just doesn't add up. How could you, like, how do you make it work? What's the magic sauce? It isn't magic. It's just that we have to make it work. We have no other choice. So by writing it down, by having it in a clear budget, and seeing this is my income, this is my expenses, when you have it in front of you, all of a sudden you see that many of the expenses that you think that you need, all of a sudden, hey, I don't need, you think that you can afford, all of a sudden you see, hey, I don't afford, I can't afford it, so perhaps we should go away with it for the time being. We start finding of other ways to make the budget work. We look at sort other sources of revenue in order to make it work. For some people it's easier, some people we find the solution immediately, and other people it takes a couple of months, but there's always a solution. Now, in terms of, in terms of you mentioned before about credit card, and I know that you are very vocal about the topic of credit cards. I know in the, in the secular world, Dave Ramsey is known to have um, that policy in speaking about, very vocal about speaking about credit cards in general. What is it? the issue of credit cards that, you know, if you speak to every J uh, person, I'll say, you know what, I love using my credit card. I earn points, I earn this, I earn that. And ultimately I could gain 30 days, 60 days, depending on when the purchase is and so on and so forth. What is the main issue from your lens that you're seeing with people using credit cards? I'll start with what, what most people think the issue is. Most people think that the, the biggest issue is the interest and the late fee. And people say, hey, look, I don't have any late fees. I've never in my life paid any interest, so I'm good. And I actually believe that the interest is the best part of credit cards because it wakes people up. 0% APR cards are way, way worse than interest credit cards. The main problem of credit cards is that you end up spending more than you otherwise would have. You mentioned points. When you spend on credit cards, you get one up to 2% in cash back, in points and rewards. The statistic, the statistic shows that the average American spends 7 to 12% more on a credit card than on a debit card. And it just spends easier. And that's not true to our community. In our community, with human toys and large families, Constant, we go travel to, to, to the country in the summer. You know, um, you we mentioned Christmas season, Simchas, um, large families and everything else. It's probably closer to 30 to 40 percent that people spend more on a credit card than on a debit card. It isn't that their budget is 30 to 40 percent higher because the mortgage and rent isn't included and the car isn't included in that equation necessarily, but it's things that you just swipe, you spend more. Probably around 15 percent on the monthly expenses whether it's Amazon shopping, Walmart, all the other, all the random purchases, takeout, buying ready food, and then there's the annual expenses that with a credit card, hey, look, I can afford my halamite and take a family trip, take a midwinter vacation and all the other expenses that with a debit card wouldn't have happened or would have happened on a way lower level. Would you say it's it's a mindset? Uh, Meaning to say, is it like, let's say you mentioned, uh, you know, a, a family trip. Do you think is if I put it on my credit card, I don't pre-plan exactly how much the cost will be, and therefore whatever it is at the door, I just pay. Versus if I spend it in a debit card, I much more I have a mindset to understand: okay, how much will this trip cost? 
or is it the actual purchase? Because we're, we're not, because there are all kinds of people. Yeah, we're not talking about the reckless person that will rake up his credit card, uh, um, you know, without without any understanding of how he's going to cover it. We're talking about even the responsible person. You feel the statistic is they're going to be spending more. But what is it? Is it the planning of it, or is it the actual transaction? It's the actual transaction. It's the impulse at the purchase. Is hey, can afford it? I want it and. Um, let's just do this wipe. I can tell, tell you a thousand stories of people that where it made a difference to them. I remember this one guy, he told me that he st- we started the meeting. He came with his wife. We started the meeting. I said, by the way, before you start, I, got, I just come, came back from a Florida vacation, paid for just by points. I don't want to discuss credit cards. I want to continue living on credit cards. I asked him, okay, sure, just one question if you don't mind. Do you feel like you spend more on a credit card than on a debit card? And he told, tells me, no, I don't. I told him, okay, let's move on. Around a half hour later into the meeting, he leans over to his wife, tells her a secret, they start counting with their fingers, and then he tells me, okay, so first of all, we just realized that there's a $500 in certain expenses that run monthly on the credit card for the past three years that on the debit card we would have stopped. So that in and of itself is $18,000 over the past three years. And then he came up with, 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 Another five thousand dollars in expenses on the spot, and that's what he was counting the thousands of dollars that he that he spent just because hey I have money he had twenty thousand dollars in his account he walked through duty free and picked up a fifteen hundred dollar wash that's still in the box and he never opened it with a debit card with the money going out of your account even though the person can afford it he wouldn't have made that purchase that's what he came back saying and we see that every day my friends and I we went to Israel on the trip and. The one person that spent on the debit card found himself staying, spending a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars more than the other of us that spent on the debit card. Oh wow! So, so you're saying that the impulse buying and the, the buying patterns of those people because they have the credit card and they feel, okay, here's here I might have a return later, and here I might uh, might return it. This is uh, might uh, maybe I want it. I don't need it. Versus the debit card purchases are made because you know the money is leaving the account immediately. Correct. It's human nature. Got it. Now, is there instances that you do feel that using a credit card is helpful for financial stability? For personal use? Yes. I don't think so. Now, I have a credit card. I actually have two cards. My wife has one. We keep our cards open for our credit. One of the arguments is, hey, I need to build my credit. I keep my cards open. And I use it every January for a $5 swipe and pay it off immediately just to keep the card active. Yes, once a year is good enough. I get a question a lot. So we use that once a year. What I also do is whenever I travel, I spend the entire trip on debit cards, but we take along the credit card in case the car rental or sometimes the hotel in some instances um, requires a credit card. In many cases, I checked out at Aza's budget, Hertz, and use the debit card. But in some cases, if you fly with a one-way ticket or some car rentals in Israel, I remember I had that, they do require a credit card after. So I take it along and I swipe just the car rental or just whatever is required on the credit card. And even if someone has a Chase um, debit card that charges 3% foreign transaction fee, that 3% on your trip to Israel or wherever you are, the 3% is cheaper than what you'll be spending on in excess to your, in excess to your trip had it been on credit card. So it's a good deal. Hey listeners, are you struggling to create beautiful looking proposals? Is it a hassle every time you need to prepare a quote or proposal for your clients? Is collecting signatures still a manual process? Well, it's time to upgrade to Pandadoc. At PTAX, we use Pandadoc for all our proposals, employee documentation, and so much more. It saves us time, keeps everything organized, and our documents look incredibly professional. With customizable templates, real-time collaboration, and e-signatures, Pandadoc turns creating documents into quick and easy steps. Plus, it integrates with so many other tools, streamlining your workflow and boosting productivity. Try Pandadoc today by visiting ptex.com co slash pandadoc and start your free trial trust me it's going to be a game changer for your business that's ptex.co slash p-a-n-d-a-d-o-c obviously there are people that that would counter that and say you know what i i've been living with credit cards paying as you said without any late fees without any interest 
and I've been having healthy uh, budgeting. You're saying for those people, could be they have the means, they have the you know the capabilities of having their extra spend, but not necessarily they're not spending more. Right. I have a friend that a millionaire. He just switched from debit from credit to debit, and he says that during his switch, he realized that he's overspending by approximately fifteen thousand dollars a month in extra spending because it's on the credit card. And as a switch, he said, hey, look, look, I can afford it, but now I'm saving $180,000 a year. Other people that say that are either people that can afford it and otherwise they just would have had more money. Because on debit, you still buy everything you need and want as long as you can afford it. It's just the extras that happened, happened on the credit card. You still go to the steakhouse but on the, when you can afford it. But in the steakhouse, on the credit card, it just naturally, you end up buying more than you need and food stays over on the table. Now, that's number one. Number two, where we hear this argument a lot is by people in their 20s or low 30s, which life hasn't really kicked in. They don't have teenagers. They don't have the large family yet. And they say, hey, look, I can afford it. Well, of and, I, and I never paid interest and I never paid extra. Of course, and I'm on top of every transaction. I paid off every week. Yeah, that's only when the expenses are still minimal. In according to life, once you you hit 35, you have larger grown kids, and you start making hassle. At that point, too many people fall behind. Even those that manage to stay responsible for years, for, for, for many years. So, so that's why even those people just get off credit cards as soon as possible. Got it. Now let's go back to to obviously you've met with uh, many many people and you helped uh, th those people get that free and ultimately create their budget. Where would you say is the you know obviously there's always the the one or two places where you find the money okay so which means is where are the places where you immediately tell people here is where you need to focus on stopping doing this or starting to do this like what are the some common things you could share for our listeners that may not get to meet with you personally while well, they're hearing you now and they want to take some action. Where are the places where a person could start focusing on? So the fun part is that rarely do I say you got to cut an expense. Almost never. Only when it's a, a, a mindset that, hey, there is no other option. I have to do this. And I, do you really have to? Or just the limitations that you thought and with a five minute conversation, your mindset can completely switch and we have that a lot. But I, rarely do I say you're spending too much on this in this area. Instead, we let the numbers do the talking. Then the, the idea of the budget isn't that you're restricted, you can't spend, you must cut. It isn't that. The budget just tells you your reality. And it shows you, hey, if you can't cover your month, if you have $10,000 in income and $13,000 in expenses, the budget tells you that you can't afford to buy a breakfast every day for $10 plus a drink plus perhaps a lunch. The budget tells you that you can't afford it, but it isn't me telling a, per a client what it is that they're overspending. And it's everyone in a different way. It's human nature is that you spend probably 110, 120% of your income. It's called Parkinson's law. We can go into that another time or soon, but the person actually spends more. So it's across the board. And then by seeing the numbers, you see where, you, where it is that you want to cut down. Yeah, I think I think one of the things is that when you know your numbers, and it's like in everything in business, if you are able to identify the problem, not necessarily you find a solution to it, but it's, at least it makes it easier to find a solution, or ultimately you are able to pinpoint and pay attention to the problem in the first place. I think um, on a, from a budgeting perspective, I think I mentioned to you last time we spoke, is... Um, you probably have your way of, of doing the Excel file, but at one point I put together a, an Excel file for people to download. And for our listeners, you can go to ptexgroup.com slash budget and just download a copy of an Excel, uh, you know, a Google Sheet uh, budget. And the reason for that is uh, some people say, you know what, I rather don't want to know my numbers because it's not going to add up. What I say, if you know your numbers, sometimes it's not y yes, you're off with the numbers. So let's say this, uh, I think I share with you this guy that, created a spreadsheet, put in this information, and he was off with $8,500 for the year. But this $8,500, he felt it every single day. Every single month, he kept on feeling it. But now he knows the number. Five minutes before putting in the numbers on the sheet, he didn't know the numbers eight and a half. And even if we say, put a spread, it's $10,000, fine, it's $10,000. But then I told him, let's be creative. Um, what do you do for a living? He works for a company. Is your is boss satisfied with you? And he says, yes. 
okay, is there a way that you should have a sit down conversation with your boss and ask them, is there a way you should earn another $10,000 in the next couple of months? And, and he says, absolutely. I think I could add so much more value to what, I, what I'm existing doing. And it didn't pass four to five weeks. And he made a phone call to me and he told me that I got a raise for $15,000 with obviously conditions of what I'm going to bring to the table. But now you went from the totally unknown, being in, in, in pain every single day or every time he needs to pay a credit card or any type of expense to knowing their numbers, to finding a solution and actually having the solution. So I think living in denial because it's anyway not going to match up, you're hurting yourself because sometimes it's not going to match up, but you could do something if you know what that number is all about. Right. Have you found that as well to be the case? Absolutely. And the first story that comes to mind, and of course we have done, if not hundreds of such stories, is Naftali Ostreicher, um, our coach here, had also a client that came in and said, hey, I'm over budget by $1,500 a month, and what solution can we come up with? They ran the budget and they saw that the actual number is a negative $5,000 a month. So that's $60,000 per year. And he said that there's nothing I can do. I'm already maxed at my position. Unlike um, the story that you were saying, he said, I'm already maxed, there's nothing I can do. But then they spent some time on brainstorming what could I come up with? They came up with one solution immediately, which increased his salary by $30,000 a year. Oh, wow. Step two was to come up with additional $30,000, and they're actively working on how could we, even though we think that we're maxed out, how can we, can we through cutting expenses and raising income, close the gap? But without knowing, without seeing the numbers in front of you, you think it's 1500 when it's 5000 you don't realize what actions are necessary to be done. Got it. Now, let me, let me ask you a very important a shift to conversation to a very important uh, topic. And this is something that I would love to hear your opinion about, because um, this is something that um, I think is part of the problem, where you see spouses uh, not being on the same page. Sometimes the breadwinner is the husband or vice versa, and they seem not to share the full financial um, story because they're seen as a potential failure if they're not bringing up to, you know, if they're not making enough money as what the cost of living is. So I've heard it from a lot of people that rather I'm not going to share the financial um, story to my, you know, to my spouse, with my spouse. First of all, I want to ask you, have you also seen that as part of the problem? And what is your um, response to that? And how do people deal with that, um, making sure that, both spouses are on the same page when it comes to the financial stability. I've seen that because we've seen almost everything or close to it at least. I don't see it as a general problem. Yes, we've seen people have this issue and then people have others, but we work on overcoming everything. In this case, if one, people, one spouse has um, a dire financial situation and they're hiding it from the other spouse and they want to come, uh, we always recommend spouses, couples come together. This way we can really represent the two and create something that works for both, not just one spouse. But in such cases, if someone has this, we say, okay, you can come by yourself and we work it out, we work on a solution, and then see after this in a couple of months, we can be 100% open of the financial situation that we're in and nothing needs to be hidden anymore. We've had success in that, Baruch Hashem, as well. And we have, just with spouses, he has his goals and she has her goals, different visions, different things that they want to accomplish by both coming together. We find a common ground, um, a plan that works for both. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'm just going to just go back to what I like the point about um, sharing with your spouses is because a lot of times you could see a person that's really, really in, in a financial healthy state. And one of if you'll speak to the person, you'll say, why? Because I have money coming in but my spouse is a spender and ultimately whatever comes in goes out, so to speak, before it even hits my bank account. And my response to that sometimes is because maybe you never had that conversation of what you could afford or you can't afford. And I want to make sure that our listeners understood what you said right from the get go when we started the conversation is you start off with the end goal of the financial goals because nobody wants to live paycheck to paycheck and just, just to survive. You want to thrive, which means you have financial goals. Should it be savings? Should it be a, a buying a car? Should it be buying a house? Whatever it is. 
And the goal with your spouse needs to be that. Once you start off that, that on that, how many families have made a decision, oh, we're not going upstate this year because we're going to renovate our house. That's a decision between two spouses. You know, it's not one person says, okay, I'm leaving, I'm, I'm going up, upstate and I'm using the, the money there and you're spending over here. It was a, a calculated decision between both spouses. So my response to those people that say, you know what, my, you know, my spouse might be a spender could be because you didn't share anything else. Ultimately, of course, if the money's there, I'm going to try to spend it. But if you'd say, let's save more money because let's do this expenditure or even even a honeymoon, maybe it's a honeymoon next year. Uh, and therefore, we're not going to buy, you know, six dollar lattes for, for, for a couple of months. That's a decision that the two of you make together. And ultimately, it's not yes, spend, not spend. We're going to we're going to put the money where the, the things that are most important for both of us. Absolutely. And finances is actually statistically the number one cause of marital issues in the country, um, financial issues. And working on the finances is actually something that's fantastic for Shulam Bayer of creating, first having financial peace, which is eliminating the anxiety, financial anxiety, or um, any other issues that might arise through it. And it's also building something together, um, achieving the financial goals, and of course, saving up for marrying off children, retirement, uh, working on passive income, and all those other, other things as well. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you another question, which is um, the concept of, uh, we see a lot, and the housing market is pretty, pretty high, especially in New York and the surrounding areas where rentals are spending a lot of their income just to cover their basics, which is rent. Uh, these conversations come up all the time, and probably to you way more than to me or to anybody else, um, which is, should I spend a little bit more, go above and beyond, and stretch myself to the limit, and rather put a down payment and buy a house, but at least the money's going to my mortgage, the house that I own, versus maybe live a little bit more comfortable, or even a, less debt, and ultimately spend for rent. I know that each situation is differently, but as an overall principle, what's your response to that? As an overall, uh, as an overall goal, buying a house is essential. Rents always increase, and if we're seeing now prices in Borough Park for a three-bedroom apartment going from twenty-five hundred a month or three thousand a month to five thousand dollars a month, it won't stay at five thousand. The long term, it'll increase even more. So the solution is to buy a house and then you lock yourself in with this price for the next 30 years and then the, the, the mortgage is paid for and all you pay is taxes and insurance. Now I know that tax and insurance might increase but it's a couple of pennies. Barely inflation, it, increase, it increases barely at the rate of inflation probably less. Versus rent increases and increases and increases. So buy, and buying a house is essential. Then you have the equity. If you need to upgrade, you have additional equity to sell this house and go and, and buy another house if you need to move as well. You don't have the issues of a landlord, landlord saying, "Hey, I need this house now. Spend fifty thousand dollars on moving and, and 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 finding another apartment in a different area as well." Finding owning a house is essential. Now, look, when it comes to the current market, we're in an extremely expensive market right now. While rents are increasing to insane numbers. Buying a house is also in many areas, high, many Hamish areas also had the same, not in the same numbers. And we see people um, going for mortgages, being a lot, going for mortgages for six thousand dollars a month, and larger families spending ten or twelve thousand dollars a month on their mortgage. I wouldn't advocate in the, in, in the current market go and buy a house and spend ten thousand dollars or seven thousand dollars for a month to buy a house. But what I'm confident is that even though the numbers don't make sense right now. It will make sense in the years to come. It's a galgal We had stability in the market until 2007. Then we had 07 that inflated. 08, we had the market crash. And then it was stable from 2010 until 2021. And now it increased. Things are stable, but stable times will be coming in. But let me ask you, um, uh, let's, let's go a little bit deeper on this topic. Um, so let's say, and this is actually a, a conversation that I had with someone. Uh, he's a salesperson. He's three years in the business. He have he has a track record of how much he made the last three years, but it's not a it's not a stable income because it's commission based. So, 
he's looking to actually go from a rental to a, to buying a house. He found a good opportunity. Is it reckless from him to decide? Okay, based on what I made the last couple of years as commission, I'm gonna di- I'm gonna dive into something that I feel would make sense for me financially, or maybe not because I don't have anything saved as a cushion. Maybe next year's uh, with the market, I won't have that that amount of commission coming my way. How long in advance do a, does a person need to plan out to say you're making this uh, this commitment to yourself? You know how much of data or how much money do you need to be able to predict as far as your salary or the same thing could be maybe tomorrow you get fired of your job you know your undertaking is this huge mortgage and buying your own house so how how do you calculate those those risks so uh, kind of this position there is always 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 risk when someone drives home from work from his office to, to his house he doesn't know if, if he'll have an accident so just there's a small chance. So it is always a risk. So you don't have to go all conservative and not take risks. And of course you need to buy a house and you need to calculate the risk. If it's an unstable business, which has taken a hit, some industries recently have taken a hit where people have made a lot of money over the past many years. If he, if he's in such a line, then it isn't about, hey, should I buy a house or not? It's, you have to think about your income. Is your income stable or not? And if it is, then yeah, of course, take the risk and assume that hey, um, my 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 income has been my commissions have been increasing over the past year, as if the past few years, ten twenty percent. I'll be able to handle my growing family and the mortgage as well. Absolutely, do it. Even though there's the risk of who says the company will perform or not, there's a risk with everything. You want to calculate what's the risk level in it. But of, of course, if you have the ability and it makes sense. And you mentioned that if you have a good opportunity to buy a house, which makes sense, absolutely go ahead and buy the house. Got it. Let's talk about savings. Um, I think nobody is, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's young enough to start saving. You have to start saving as soon as you can. You know, it's something that even a principal like now, I told my, my kids that went to camp, I'll give them money for canteen and for goodies, whatever it is. But for every dollar that you bring home, you're going to get another dollar in return. I love it. Yeah, because I felt that let me give them an incentive. Not that I'm not giving you the money in the first place, not I'm not telling you to not to buy, but if you, you decide I could get away without it, there is going to be a reward because I want to you know, teach them the lesson of starting to save when they're young. I guess, I guess part of the budget, part of your when you sit with someone and you're planning out their budget, there needs to be a, save, a saving mechanism in place, especially if they're younger and eventually they're going to have weddings, other expenses as life um, grows and the family grows and, and, and so on and so forth. Are you a believer of starting slow and fast on, on the growing, uh, on the on the savings, which means is even it means a couple of dollars because they can't afford more or rather wait in a certain time in, when your budget allows to, to, to do larger savings? No, you, you have to start start as soon as you can. And if someone doesn't have the ability to save up for marrying off his children, as long as he isn't in debt, to say, hey, let's create a wedding fund and just add $10 so the wedding fund is open, and then you know that you have to increase it. I'll just go back. You mentioned what you did with your children and their kakim money. I love it. I have a client that tells me that his parents helped him out after the, his husband for the first few years, and the father would give him X, X amount of money every month. And every month that he stayed over with extra money, he would give him a bonus. Oh, wow. <laughs> and it came to the month of Paisa, and he used up all his money. And he came to his father and said, Tati, I need more money. Paisa is expensive. And his father asked him, okay, how much money do you have left? He said, I used everything up. He said, sorry, come back next month. And it was, the son told me that that was a valuable lesson. Um, spend less than what you have. I won't bail you out. I can help you out, but know how to save. So yes, you want to start. Any mechanism or any um, practical advice you would be able to give on that? So that means putting it in a different bank account, like the profit first mentality. Is it putting it into some sort of uh, mutual fund or whatever? Like what, what do you suggest for an average person that could start saving and has the capabilities of? So let's review the financial goals that most people have, which include say The first goal is cover the month. So many people don't even realize that their first financial goal should be covered in the month. They don't realize that they're in the negative. 
I see people constantly that, hey, yeah, I'm covering, I earn $300,000 a year, life is good. When we review their expenses, we see that they're in a minus of $3,000 a month despite earning um, close to $30,000 a month. So number one goal is cover the month regardless of your income level. If you're in a minus, if you don't cover, cover the month. Goal number two is as long as you have a debt, pay it off immediately. Switch from credit card to debit card. If you owe friends or any other institutions, just pay it off and live a debt-free life. Shlomo Melech says, Avid Malva, the borrower is slave to the lender. Don't be a slave. Be free. Goal number three is have an emergency fund. Set up an X amount of, uh, of, of dollar amount, let's say it's two or three months worth of expenses, let's say $25,000. Save that up, keep it in the savings account, and don't touch it. Don't invest it. People say, hey, I have my money. It's losing value with inflation. Let it lose value. It buys you another value. It buys you the tranquility. It's a peace of mind of knowing if something happens. We, we all remember COVID. That's the best example. It's a macro example, but we all remember it. All of a sudden, one week to the next, everything got shut down. Unemployment was still a double All the other bailouts weren't the here yet. Businesses were shut. People didn't know how they lived. People that had an emergency fund had a peace of mind. Hey, whatever happens, I can cover my life in the next few months. And then we have it in the micro level as well. Someone has a financial emergency. Um, during a simcha, suddenly you have a $6,000 expense come up. And you can handle your simcha easily. Uh, someone mentioned that he had to be in a, in a hospital with his children for a few, with his child for a few months. He had an, his emergency fund. He was able to focus on the family's health and well-being instead of worrying about money. You want to have that emergency fund. And if it's tied up in the market or tied up in the property or tied up elsewhere, you lent it. All of a sudden, when you need it, the money isn't there. You want to keep it safe. Now, you also want to keep it in a high yield savings account. There are bank accounts that offer um, between 2 to 4% for just keeping the money there. If you keep it in Chase, we have two issues. Number one, you keep on borrowing money from that account and never paying it back. Whenever you do, it's money that you would have saved otherwise. And you just keep on transferring. So you want to keep it in a different bank. Number two, in Capital One, they currently offer 4.25% of your money. If you have $10,000, you'll earn $400, $425 a year just to keeping it there. It's free money. Why not? So you want to keep it in a high yield savings account. The next goal is if you want to buy a house or an investment property, save up for that. And that money also, you want to save it up in a savings account as long as you have the ability to buy the house in the next year, up to five years, keep it in a savings account and just watch the, watch the money grow and grow and grow. So when the opportunity comes, you can buy that house. When it comes to marrying off children, as soon as the baby is born, that's when you need to start focusing on the wedding fund. The best place to put the money is in mutual funds. The best example of a mutual fund is the S&P 500. We can go into uh, explain what it is in two minutes. Essentially, a company that's on the stock market, let's say Apple is on the stock market, you can buy a share in Apple and you become a partner in Apple. So. If an Apple share is $100, and now you have one share, if Apple doesn't perform and people, people don't want to buy the Apple stock, it drops down to $50, and you still own your share, but it lost value because the share is worth less. If Apple is performing, then people want to buy and become partners in Apple. They buy the share, and it goes up to $150, and therefore, if you sell, you made $50. Buying a stock in an individual company I'm not a financial advisor, but I don't recommend, I, I wouldn't advise my brothers, my children to buy um, stocks in single companies because it's essentially as gambling. Because had you bought stocks, then in 2007, you would have bought BlackBerry and not Apple. A couple of years ago, you would have bought Bed Bath & Beyond. So you don't know which stock to buy. So you don't know which company will perform in the long term. So you don't want to buy, uh, at least I don't recommend my friends and family to buy individual stocks. But the S&P 500 is a large portfolio of 500 large American companies, which in America is the largest economy in the world. So when you buy a share of the S&P, uh, one share of S&P 500 and the majority of companies increase and historically have increased, then your value goes up. We had years that it, that it crashed. For example, 2000, 2003, the dot-com bubble. In 2008, it crashed again. In 2022, it dropped. 
But for the long term, it might be down. For the short term, it might be down. For the long term, historically, it's been up. So where I put uh, the wedding foot for my children, I buy a share in the S&P 500. As long as my son isn't 16, 17, or probably even 15, that's three, four years leading up to when they might become engaged. For the short term, I wouldn't invest in the S&P 500 for them, but in the long term, if I have a baby, I invest in the S&P 500, put there in the money, and watch it over the years grow. Very, very nice. I open a separate mutual fund account per child. So each child, if I have one account, then my oldest son gets married, and I'll use most of the money for him. Now I know that this money is dedicated to the oldest, this to the second, this to the third, and... We save up, we buy funds of Seattle Deshmaya, it increases. And if we see a crash, then if it drops, for example, the weekend of August 2nd, I believe it dropped like 6%, that's when we say, hey, it's for sale, we can buy, we can buy even more. We don't panic that, hey, I lost money. That's where I recommend people save for the wedding. Nice. Let me ask you another, um, maybe a little bit controversial. Um, I know we mentioned before Dave Ramsey, and he's no, known to be um, very vocal about a lot of the topics are related to financial in the non-Jewish world. And there's a lot of debate, people that do f- financial planning within the Jewish world and saying, okay, his, his way of doing financials don't work for us because we have v- way larger expenses on an ongoing basis more than the typical just buying a house, just by the, the way of living, our, our, as you mentioned before, our human toivum, our marrying off our children, the way our, our society, tuition, and so on and so forth. Do you agree with that premise or you disagree? So when I started coaching just my friends about finances, a nice couple of people asked me, hey, who do you follow? Dave Ramsey, Dave Ramsey. And after I heard the name so many times, I looked him up and I started listening to his podcast. And I thought that what he said makes sense. It's absolutely fantastic. But it, is, just, it isn't geared to our community. So if someone has the extra time, they should absolutely spend some time on listening to him. The principles are amazing, but if we want to apply it to Hamish lifestyle, what I've done is I've taken personal finance and applied it for it to work for the Hamish lifestyle. He did an interview with Let, um, the Money Podcast, I forgot what that name is. Let, yeah, Kosher Money. Kosher Money. So I did an interview there, and many people really appreciated the interview, and others said, hey, he just said yeah, Change, it said his basic radio show and use Heimish words like private school. He changed the words for us. And if you can't afford um, the Pisces season, just don't buy maps. I'm not sure if he said that, but um, people said it wasn't geared to us. So the idea is that it absolutely, it's absolutely important to listen to him for the person that has the ability and the time to and wants to accomplish. It's just we can customize the plan to work for us. Got it. Another question is, obviously, you meet with different types of people and obviously also different age groups. Um, do you see different trends by, let's say, somebody that's 40, 50 versus somebody that's 20, 30 when it comes to handling money today's day and age? I don't think so. I see you with the best in all age ranges. I, I guess my, my question is, um, let's say you mentioned credit card. Let's say once upon a time, at least my father's generation was all about having their bundle of cash spending money with cash, once in a while using credit cards and so on and so forth. Today, the younger people are getting married right now, they're living over the credit card. You ask them for a dollar cash, they don't have a dollar cash in their pockets. Is part of the society and those those changes actually make it, having a ripple effect on the financial challenges that people are facing or it still comes back to the mindset? Everything is mindset, um, but absolutely the way life is set up nowadays, people do um, splurge on credit cards and people don't understand the value of a dollar as previous generations, but if you even older people forgetting what the value of a dollar meant to them growing up and they've caught up. Got it. In terms of, uh, obviously, if, as I mentioned before, you met with a lot of people and you have, I've seen um, some of the messages that you get, you've been getting from people living debt free. What is the most rewarding part of your job? Seeing that the amount of people that have literal freedom, it's amazing. And the best part is we can have clients here that say, hey, I can't cover the month. I have so much stress, I can't cover basics. And then just six months later, 
they don't even remember that they were in such a scenario. I tell them because I remember because if they couldn't cover the month now, I write down cover the month as a goal, a financial goal. And then we, six months later, um, I ask them, how is this with covering expenses? Yeah, what do you mean? It's easy. Life is good. Life is great. And they don't even remember the position that they were in. And that's just fantastic. Wow. We see people with wedding funds. Someone just sent me a message that he has a few week old baby and he already has 600 and change in the wedding fund, 300 and change in the Ramitza fund. It's absolutely amazing. Setting yourself up with a status um, for the future and living life freely. I want to just, um, um, th- you know, ask you one more question before we wrap up, um, which is um, we touched, obviously, personal uh, finances, which is your own personal budgeting. Does a lot of those same principles rely on business or business usually has much more flexibility because you're running and you're investing and so on and so forth? I don't coach business, businesses per se. We've had some exceptions. I, don't, I like to stick to my field. Got it. How could people find out more about you? Um, they can reach out to us, uh, Tower Solutions. Our phone number is 845-322-6500, 845-322-6500. We're available on call, phone, text, uh, WhatsApp. For the links, resources mentioned in this episode, check out the show notes at www.ptechgroup.com slash podcast, where we'll link um, to find out more about um, Chaim's work and on Tower Solutions. Let's close with the four rapid fire questions. Are you ready? Sure. Number one, a book to change your life. Think and grow rich. Number two, a piece of advice you got that you'll never forget. Oh, so many. Um, I wasn't prepared for that. That's that's why it's called rapid fire questions. <laughs> Remove your limitations. Most people have their limitations. They created by themselves. And then they follow those limitations. I think it's not possible. I can't. I can't. You could. Just remove those limitations. Wow. Number three, anything you wish you could go back and do differently. I don't think so. Beautiful. And last and final question, what's still on your bucket list to achieve? Passive income. Nice. Chaim, thank you so much for joining us. I know your time is valuable. That is why in the name of our listeners, we'll forever be grateful for sharing some of your time with us today. It's been a blast. Thanks for the opportunity. That's my conversation with Chaim Tauber. My takeaway from this one, number one, take inspiration from real-life success stories of individuals who achieve financial freedom through disciplined savings and smart financial planning. This can provide motivation and practical strategies for your own financial journey. Number two, focus on paying off high interest debt. First, such as credit card balances. Once those are cleared, you can allocate more funds for savings and investment. Number three, if you need to build or improve your credit, use credit cards strategically for essential purchases and always pay on time. This helps build a positive credit history without falling into that trap. Number four, for long-term saving goals, consider high-yield savings accounts or mutual funds such as the S&P 500 to grow your money more effectively. And number five, begin by identifying your long-term financial goals. Whether it's paying off debt, saving for a house, or preparing for retirement, having a clear vision helps in creating a focused financial plan. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Let's Look Business podcast. I hope you enjoyed the practical, no-nonsense advice that our guests shared. If you found value in listening, I would be so grateful if you could share the episode with your friends and if you could give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever platform you listen. Subscribe to the show and get notified every time we publish a new episode. The Let's Look Business podcast is a P-Tex Group original production. Until next time, make it a great day. 